Hi, my name is Sylvia, and I wrote a book called uh, Butterfly Child, A Mother's Journey. It took me about 20 years to write this book. It uh, entails the life of my son, Nikki, uh, that was born with uh, recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. About 20 months before Nikki was born, I also um, suffered a loss of a full-term baby, which I named Alex, and uh, that was really traumatic for me. So I included that story in the book because the way... Um, I handled um, Nikki and his struggles. Um, a lot of it had to do with uh, with my grief over Alex's death. So today, um, this is EB Awareness Week, and I wanted to do something special. And I was wrestling with what to do, and then I thought maybe um, I would write an, I would read you an excerpt from my book. So uh, this is a very thick book; is over four hundred pages. And what I picked to read you today is um, from chapter four, and the chapter is called a Recessive Dystrophic. There's about 25 chapters in this book. Each one has a particular title and a particular quote right under it from a famous person that pretty much tells me, or tells me, it tells you um, what to expect pretty much from this chapter. So without further ado, here we go. Chapter four, Recessive Dystrophic. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Martin Luther King Jr. Bringing Nikki home from the hospital was something magical. I dreamed about having a newborn in the house since before Alex died, so I spoiled him rotten. I sang to him, rocked him, and kissed him endlessly. I never put him down. Alex, however, had been my supreme teacher. It was him that taught me that the only sadness I should feel at the birth of his brother and his condition was the fact that they were those who had yet to meet him. He was my angel on earth, of that I had no doubt. Alex would be watching over him forever. The nurses at the hospital had instructed us to give Nikki Tylenol every few hours forever. To me, that whole notion of having Nikki medicated constantly, even though he looked comfortable and happy, seemed strange. Once home, I decided that I would only give him pain medication if I felt he needed it. Despite it all, Nikki was mostly a happy baby. I watched him pay close attention to his moods and cries quite a bit to make sure he was okay. I became a little obsessed about the breathing, to be honest. I would wake up at night to make sure I noticed even the slightest movement of his chest to reassure me. During the day, I was even worse. If he slept longer than an X amount of hours, I would panic. Never for a moment did I take his life for granted. I knew it could slip away at any time. I had learned the hard way that life was incredibly fragile, and Sid's was my worst nightmare. My mother-in-law left that day, um, the day we, day we brought home Nikki, while, we, while my mom stayed with us for another month. It was fabulous having her there. We started having a daily routine of changing bandages. It all seemed strange and uniquely natural. While the nurse, who visited once a week, would take off all his dressing at once and then replace them, when my mom and I did them, we decided to do one limb at a time. This way, he could not scratch or kick his exposed skin while he was naked and create more wounds and blisters. I carefully cut any new blisters drained the liquid without tearing more skin than necessary, covered the wound with Vaseline gauze, cushioned the wound with various products, and covered the whole area with rolled gauze. It wasn't long until we figured out that areas that were covered with gauze would not be easy to blister, or that areas that we could not bandage, such as anything on his face, would need to be moistened a little every day for the area to heal well. We tried to do things normally. We went to the mall to have Nikki take a photo with Santa, and we went out for Christmas dinner. The one thing I could not do, and the one thing I needed most, was to immerse myself in books written by professionals or by other parents who had children with EB. Well, I could not find any. The most I could get my hands on was a few pages in textbooks. The internet was worthless. It was still in its infancy, and it didn't have a tiny fraction of the information that would become available later on. I needed to know what to expect, what products to use. I needed to talk to other parents, all needs that were left unfulfilled. 
we would have to learn everything by ourselves, by trial and error. I was not looking forward to that. I felt Nikki deserved better, but we had no other choice. Without memoirs to read or websites to probe, the journey was going to be painstaking. It was regardless, nobody's job but mine. I was Nikki's mother, his advocate, and one responsible for dealing with his future. It became clear right away that using a needle to aspirate the liquid from the blister was not going to work. Not only it was extremely hard to do with a weakly newborn, but also the blister would refill. At first we just started to make a ton of holes in the blister and that worked better, but in the long run we just started tearing the blister up with scissors or a needle and that was best. It's important for me to note that when Nikki was little, covering up the wound with the torn up skin was indeed the best bandage. One time when he tore up his skin, I covered it back with his own skin and there was hardly a hint of a wound there afterwards, but that would not work as Nikki got older. This is the reason why the doctor wanted us to aspirate the liquid from the blister to keep the natural bandage of his skin on it, but if the blister were too large, loose skin would easily be refilled. It's the nature of the beast. The first six weeks at home, I was lucky to have my mom's help. I would sleep cradling Nikki. I was too afraid to let him sleep alone in his bassinet even if it was just next to my bed. In the morning I would give him to my mom so I could catch a few Z's. I took advantage of her until she left and then I went practically without any sleep for the following two months. Sleep, however, was a small issue compared to the precautions we had to take to make sure Nikki didn't hurt himself. Until Nikki was four months old, he had to wear mittens to protect his face from scratches, and then he wore gloves that were made of lycra and were elastic so that the tips of his fingers could be free. When we first let his fingers out of the mittens, they t tremendously fascinated Nikki. We had little dangling toys on his infant seat so he could use them. It was so cute to see him experiment with his newfound hands. Of course, that's where the damage began damage that would be detrimental. We did not know back then what chore keeping his hands useful would become in the years ahead. One area that had to be heavily bandaged were his heels and feet because he would kick and whip around and he already had those wounds from the ankle bracelets we kept trying to get to stay healed. If I laid him down I would make sure there was a small pillow in the area where his feet would kick to minimize the damage. Any time we left a foot without bandages and say just put a sock on it, a blister would reappear out of nowhere. I could not wear clothes that had buttons or anything that might cause a blister if rubbed against. I could not wear jewelry, including watches. My nails had to be extremely short. Nikki could not wear anything that had buttons or was harsh, like jeans. Tags on his clothes had to be cut, and sometimes his clothes had to be worn backwards so the seams would be on the outside. Everything had to be soft and easy to put on, with a large hole for his head to pass through without needing to do any pulling. There was no way to pick him up under his armpits. We had to put one hand under his bottom and one to hold his back or head, and that was the only way to do it. Everything had to be padded, from the stroller to the bed, from the swing to the pan. I went through the classic, why me? I cried, I yelled. I howled like a wounded animal, and then I pressed him gently to my heart. In response, he smiled, unaware of my sadness, and that made me love him even more. Sure, he would have a tough life. It would not be the life I had dreamed for him, but it would still be worthwhile. Raising him would be a challenge, but it didn't have to be a nightmare. He would learn to crawl somehow, talk, and walk, but it would take him a lot longer and be vastly more challenging. I was sad, but I had to pull myself together. What exactly was I mourning? The loss of a normal child or my own life which had taken a significantly different turn? I knew that pumping my milk was important, so I would use this machine I rented from the hospital to pump my milk every few hours. I don't know if I never got the hang of it or I was just bad at it, but it hurt like hell, and as time went on I got less and less out, so within a month my supply was completely gone. I realized that I was not pumping in the middle of the night as they told me to, but I was getting so little sleep as it was, to get up to torture myself was not part of the agenda. Besides, I had to take care of myself in order to take care of Nikki. 
Well, research shows breast milk is best for babies. The reality was that I truly put in an honest effort, and in the end, it didn't work out. Sometimes when you have a special needs child, you have to make decisions that are less than perfect. Formula became my best friend. The one thing I didn't like was how paranoid I was becoming. Nikki would sleep in his bassinet, which had wheels, so I would take the thing with me in every room I went. The kitchen, computer room, bedroom, even the bathroom. I needed to be there to hear every breath, every cry. Each and every cry I would scramble, wondering what he was crying. Was he hungry, dirty? Did I have a blister somewhere? He was colic, too, which didn't help matters. Another thing that freaked me out was that I could not trust anyone to come in contact with Nikki. No matter how gentle I would tell him to be with Nikki, they would end up shoving the bottle into his mouth, creating a blister, or pick them up under his armpits, creating a blister, or would try to do anything that would be absolutely fine, be fine to do with any other baby, but most certainly not an EB baby. A point comes when you refuse to let anyone touch your child because you have to protect them. I was being transformed. I was becoming someone that was angry, upset at people not getting it, thinking I was making a mountain out of a molehill. This is exactly what one of my relatives once told me. Right. Never once she was present during bandage changes or heard Nikki's constant cries of pain. She had no idea what was going on. Just another example of what I had to deal with at the time. When we went back to see the dermatologist at Phoenix Children's Hospital a couple of weeks after Nikki was discharged, he came in a room with several interns eager to learn about E.B. because they had never seen a case of it and might not ever again. I suppose E.B. kids must be like unicorns or mermaids, these mystical creatures rumored to exist but rarely if ever seen. The good thing he did, though, however, was bringing in a lady, Heather, who had lost a son from E.B., the Hurlitz Junctional Forum, to help us and teach us proper wound care. When Heather saw Nikki, she immediately knew he could not possibly have the same form of EB that, had her son, that her son had, and that Nikki was going to be okay. We had yet to hear of the official diagnosis, so it was a relief to hear that. She showed us photos of her child, and we could definitely see a difference. Heather was wonderful, and told us how important wound care was, showing us exactly what she did to help her son. I never forgot it. By this time, we had done quite a bit of research ourselves and we were hoping a diagnosis would come back as simplex, the mildest of the three forms. We certainly did not want Nikki to have the junction or her form, but at this point we were fairly sure that was not the case. Nikki thrived at home. When we brought him back to the hospital to see his nurses on Christmas Eve, when he was one month old, they were in awe on how well he was doing. This was a few days before the results of the biopsy came back, confirming that Nikki had EB and classifying it as recessive dystrophic. Recessive dystrophic means actually two things. One, recessive means that the EB is inherited by both parents who carry the recessive gene. All of us have two copies of the same gene, one we got from mom and one from dad. One becomes dominant and one becomes recessive. A recessive gene is a gene that is automatically recessive unless it encounters another recessive gene so one of them has no choice but become dominant. This is why his dad, Nick, and I don't have EB. We were lucky enough to carry a good skin gene, which automatically became dominant. Our recessive gene, however, had EB. This, of course, means that any baby of ours had a 25% chance of having EB, 50% chance of being a healthy carrier like us, and 25% chance of being a healthy non-carrier. It all depends on which gene is passed on, our healthy skin gene or our defective recessive gene. And two, dystrophic. Dystrophic with EB means basically how deep the wound is. The wound from our simplex patients lie in the epidermis. Junctional lies in the junction between the epidermis and the dermis, and dystrophic lies in the dermis. This is why I often tell people, Nikki sores are like second-degree burn-like wounds because the epidermis is completely gone, and that is the reason they have to heal with moisture to avoid infections and heal properly without scarring. It was official. Nikki had RDEB, and it wasn't ever going to go away. It was our new reality, our new life. Most, if not all children, with the recessive forms of EB 
recessive dystrophics and all forms of junctional, are born to parents who didn't know they had anything to worry about. There was no test at the time to find out if you're a carrier for EB. The gene is rare, but it is everywhere. It's random, and it occurs without regard to ethnicity, class, or religion, equally present in both the genders and all races. Hence, EB families tend to be diverse. Why me and not you? Was this person, why this person and not the other? It's the magic of genetic lottery. This obscure, sneaky gene was prowling, waiting to be coupled, and if the odds had been in our favor, we would never have known. Thank you so much for listening to my excerpt from the book, Butterfly Child. You can find out more information about my book on the website, butterflychildthemothersjourney.com or the Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash butterflychildbook. Thank you so much for listening.